started off in 1959 as a uh, photographer with the Ministry of Aviation. After I came out of the Army, I was sh for a short time in May and Bakers doing microbiological research. But my boss, Mr Freeman, used to catch me reading Amateur Photographer magazine when I was supposed to be feeding his mice with drugs that we, was, that we were testing, the nitrofurans drugs. So he said, Peter, why don't you get a qualification when you can start applying for a photography job? He said, they do a, they do a course at Barking College at Technology in Longbridge Road, Barking. Oh, he said, yeah. Oh, so September came and I rushed here, I told them about it, I showed them a few camera club pictures. Oh, camera club pictures, oh, they're good. How do you do those? Oh, we'll film, develop it. Oh, all right, you can do the first exam in six months instead of a year. Oh, God, I've done the first exam. But how do, when can I do the next? Oh, you've got to wait the year for the next one, the intermediate. Oh, I have to go for a year, learn how to use four by five cameras, and high plate cameras. We've done that one. When can I do the final? Oh, we don't do the final at Barking. You've got to go to po Regent Street Polytechnic from under Professor Margaret Harker. And then you can get letters after your name. Oh, Christ, I'm wrong. Regent Street Polytechnic. So anyway, I, I applied. I managed to get a job. It's £7.15 shillings a week as a photographer with the Ministry of Aviation. And I had to go to Chessington for that. And we did a lot of secret stuff. It was all to do with aeroplanes <coughs> and I had to go in a Vulcan bomber and a Lightning fighter and a Shackleton and while I was being made, not flying, but <laughs> on the ground to photograph all the secret stuff that the Russians probably knew about anyway in the cockpit and all the controls and everything and then come back and then they'd do contact prints and the enlargements of whatever they wanted, the hydraulic system and, the, and all this secret stuff, you know, all the dials and stuff. <laughs> And then, in the end, I thought, well, £7.15 shillings, I saw an advertisement. Outdoor photographers wanted £15 a week. I mean, this is good. And it was school photography. So I signed up for that, and it was H Tempest Limited. And it was down in Cornwall. So I had to go to Cornwall to be interviewed. <coughs> and he gave me the job. But he said, well, first of all, you've got to go around the schools and book, book them. You, we don't send you up with a camera straight away. Oh, God. So I had to get myself a um, um, a little um, pop pop motorbike thing, a, a push alpine it was called, not a Lambretta, a cheaper one. Go around schools, around Essex and London, East London, trying to book them. I didn't book them very many. They gave me the sack and I didn't earn £15 a week. I, I was lucky if I earned £10 a week. So you had to go up to a school and say, yeah, kind of, kind of do that's your right. But they were already booked up with pictures of Colchester. They had the total area all sewn up. H Tempest couldn't get in, but they had a lot in Scotland. So I got sent to Scotland. So I had to drive up there with another guy, and was, he put us up in a hotel in a sort of a curved bit. I forget the Princess Terrace was it in a rather dodgy hotel, and there was. A lot of sailors would come there with young ladies and they would knock, they'd go, knock, knock, knock on the door. This special knock, they all have this same knock. They go, knock, knock, knock. I thought, What's going on? And they would let this sailor in with the young lady. But it's trouble, never used to see them at breakfast time. Funny that. Funny, wasn't it? Funny, I don't know what's going on there. I'm just being young and innocent. <laughs> Rather, a bit of a dodgy hotel, I think that was. <laughs> but some. Yeah, then I managed to get into University College London. £12 a week there, and went up, £12 a week. After a lot of failings, of <clears throat> first of all, they wouldn't let me in. They said, you've done too many jobs, you've done too much. They took someone on, he had no idea about photomicrography, and I showed them some pictures taken with an ensign selfix held over a microscope in Germany, with a microscope like that. And I took a picture down that with my inside selfix so it was in a, my lab in Germany. Oh, wonder how do you do those? I said, I took my inside on film. Well, look, you know how to do photo Oh, yeah, you know how to do photo micrography. And they gave me the job, £12 a week. I had my little studio there. Then I lasted eight years there till 1970. At UCL, um, and you got to photograph moon. The Moon Dust. Yeah, moon dust. The, the Saga of the Moon Dust, 1969. 
Well, I, I was the first photographer to get a sample of the contingency sample. Neil Armstrong scooped up, he stepped out, and I stuck it in his pocket in case they had to blast off. What they call a contingency sample, quick. So the Americans sent over a tiny little microscope slide with some of this moon dust stuck on it with a cover slip from NASA. And they sent it over to University College London, Department of Geology. So they brought it up to my studio and said, here we are, old guy. See what you can make of that photograph. It's so a little granules. I searched and searched. And at the time, I had a Vickers Armstrong projection microscope. It was like a big desk. And it had carbon arcs, two lots of carbon, like that. And it sh you struck the arc, and you had a big light coming up with two carbon which, which from the bright light. And it went down that bright light, went, to, went down a raised through power lens and onto, um, your, onto your glass plate you had. So I set up a half plate, and it was Kodak, also a half plate, glass plate in motion. And I searched and searched, and suddenly saw something interesting, a little wiggly thing. And I thought, what's that? Oh, so I took a picture of that. And the rest of it was just little tiny little granules. I couldn't see anything interesting. It was just tiny little black specks. No matter how much I enlarged it up, it was just little black specks of like d the dust, you see, volcanic dust sort of stuff. Well, there was this little wiggly thing in it. I thought, what's that? So I showed it to all the my boss, and he showed it to the professor, and his professors called up all the other learning professors. We had all gathered around my Vickers Armstrong projection microscope musing over it, and they had they got it published in the Sunday Times, half page, all about this glass globule formed by the action of the sun on the, on the rocks on the moon, and it caused a, caused a glass globule to form. But I thought to myself, well, if it's glass, how is it, when I, when I press the cover slip, how is it that flattens? Glass should be solid. It shouldn't flatten. And I was only on £25 a week at the time, and they must have been on about £80 a week, these professors. And I was right, and they was wrong, because it was a minute bit of plastic that broke it off the sieves. The Americans had sieved out all the best bits and kept all the best bits for themselves. A bit of plastic. <laughs> And, and the projector, so it, it projected the image on a surface? Yeah, the Vickers Armstrong projection microscope. It projected an image by reflect, but onto, a, onto a, a front surface mirror, and that image came up onto a screen, like a great big ground glass screen, and you could f focus it finely and see it going in and out sharp focus on your ground glass screen, and you could whip out the ground glass screen and put in a dark slide with, with your plate in it. Right, it's a bit like a large format camera. Yeah, a large format camera it was, yeah. That's right, like that, yes. Yeah, and, and what sort of things other than moon rocks? Oh, then I would have to photograph a lot of micro fossils, all to do oil, because there was a lot of oil exploration. And these students would go abroad and they would dig up bits of sand from Iran and Iraq and all these places before when all the oil was coming out, you know, all these rich blighters found, found all these oil deposits and made themselves billionaires and poor British, all, the, all we got was petrol price increases. But the students helped, helped them to find the oil by looking at the micro, micro fossils inside the earth and they could tell if there's going to be oil there. And then they would make, make a thesis about it and I would have to photograph the thing for their thesis and... And yeah. you did that for eight years, you were... Eight years, yeah. What was it like as a place to work? Well, it was a bit lonely at times because I was there on, on my own. But then when things started to get a bit bad, one of them used to get on my nerves, one of the professors and that, and started giving me so much work I couldn't get on. They, they gradually paid another underpaid assistant for me. So there's two of us there. We had to make a lot of lantern slides for projection and... And then, in the end, I introduced Ferrania colour film. I'd never seen Ferrania colour, colour slide, colour films, and micro of um, polarised pictures of rocks, for example, like, come up with colours, you see. First of all, your rock section is colourless, but you put it between twisted polarised filters and look through like that. Wow, twisted polarising filter, and all the colours come out by interference phenomena in the rocks. We've got brilliant colours. 
so I could photograph that with a that I had a Zeiss pre, a Zeiss um, photo microscope as well. It was still on a stand. It, it, you could load it up with 17 metres of film, or you could put a single cassette of film in, and I would get Ferrania colour refills. I would load my own cassettes to save them money, and then I would develop the Ferrania colour made up from, to, from the actual chemicals. I'd, I'd have one and a half litre Winchester bottles of chemistry made up and develop Ferrania colour film. And so you were still developing... The, the images you were taking, you did the whole kind of thing end to end. Still. Yeah, and then I cut them up and put them into little um, GP slide mounts, and they were used them for lectures. Okay. Mm, all the lectures were, oh, please, I, I, I sh showed them about colour photography. <laughs> it's all black and white when I first got there. <laughs> I'd never seen colour pictures. <laughs> and and this, so this was after you left the army, but before you started to do press? Yes. Well, uh, then I, I had started to do a bit of press work when I was at Univ when I was in Ministry of Aviation in 1959. I started doing a bit of press work uh, on the side. I got in with the um, Stratford Express, and they would send me out when I was home, send me out at weekend on jobs. And um, they said, "You, you um, won't use 35 millimeter, will you?" We want you to use two and a quarter square at least. I never had two and a quarter square. I never pen tax thirty-five millimeter. Never thought it. Oh no, no. So I took. I gave me a job at the Poplar Civic Theatre. There was a show on there called Streetcar Named Desire. So I had a photograph of the character, a, a lady of the night. So I thought, a lady of the night. So I thought, oh dear. I posed her up by a wall. And there was some light coming onto her face. I got posed up on the wall with this light coming on the face, low key put. It was 35 millimeter. I'd done them a print, but a whole plate print. Gave it, oh, that's great. <coughs> made a huge picture in the newspaper, and they never knew it was on 35 millimeter. Because <laughs> most of the photographers, they didn't know how to develop 35 millimeter. They got grain like golf balls, especially Tony Armstrong Jones. Everybody says he like her pictures were dreadful. But he married Princess Margaret, so he's famous, but he, his pictures used to be dreadful, evidently. He never used to know how to develop his film. And Victor Blackman, he invented, he used to use Pro Micro with tri -X. And then when I set up on my own, I, I had a agreement with the Brentwood and Shenford Argus newspaper. He would give me a retainer fee. I think it was £50 a month. Certainly, it wasn't fifty. It wasn't fifty pound a week. I'd never earned fifty pound a week. That must have been fifty pound a month. I'd have to do as many jobs as they wanted for that, but they would supply me with some film. But it was only Ilford. They had a contract with Ilford. So I had HP four. It wasn't as good as Kodak Troix. Grainy, oh, terrible. Do football, floodlit football at Billy Ricky with the floodlights, one hundred twenty fifth at full aperture. On a standard lens, couldn't use a tele lens. You have to use a standard lens and hope they come a bit close. Rating the film at 1,600, developing it. Oh my God. Came at grain like golf balls. You talked about there being like a bit of snobbishness about 120 using the medium format film. Yeah. But you, you're, you're just as happy using 35. Yes. I, I, I like to use them. Um, I, I, I use a, a roll film. When I, could, when I finally afforded the Hasselblad, I, I got a Hasselblad in 2002 um, with paid out of that um, lump sum from my retirement pension because I, I was, must have been 65 then, I suppose. I finally got a Hasselblad after all those years of wondering, you know, oh, God, blimey. I finally got one. So I got a 16 on back. So I could, I, I did not like square at the time. I got 16 on, it's like 16 pictures. And I would use a lot of that for my press work. And, my pictures, they would start on the, the early digital. If it, if you had a three megapixel camera, that, that was thought the bees knees, a three megapixel like Canon EOS at the time. One, one of the girls, press photographers from the Evening Echo at Basel, got, they were all giving out these three megapixel Canons. And she turned up and they were all gathered around her. Oh, look at this. And suddenly she pressed the wrong button and she deleted all the pictures. So they came. To, I was in the. I was in there having one of my films processed from the same job that I'd been out on. I was doing mine on film, 
And then that they was developing my film for me for some reason. So I said, have you got a picture? I forget what it was, something I had to say in Billerick. Yes, here it is, naked. Oh, can we use it? <laughs> they used my picture instead. She deleted all those. <laughs> we can't delete film. <laughs> Yeah. To have something go wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I've been on that, been out on a press job, a car crash, cra c phone call, car crash into a lamppost near Billy Ricky. Can you get there? All right. Got there. I mean, I had, what, I had a, what car did I have? I think I had a Morris Thousand Traveller at the time. Rush there, get out my camera, snap. Hey, this doesn't feel like it's winding on. Blimey, I mean, there was no film in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I turned up, I hadn't loaded the camera. Oh, you want to know the strangest thing I've photographed? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Editor from the Argus said, Peter, he says, we want you to go and photograph a ghost. A ghost? Yeah, yeah but the, this is a printing company, Billy Ricky, told us they've got a ghost appears about 11 o'clock at night in their premises. And we're like, go and get some pictures of it. I said, bloody hell, I've never photographed a ghost. So I thought, well, I don't know, I'll load up with Kodak high speed infrared film and see with a red filter and flat me flash, see what I can. So, me and the girl reporter, <coughs> going, my wife at the time had to make me a flask of tea with sandwiches. We got there 11 o'clock at night. Billy Ricky, on the way to Basildon, it was, sit there talking to these people in his printing works. Well, when's the ghost going to be? Oh, no, yeah, 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 we've seen it. We've seen it. Well, where is it? Down the corridor. I set my camera up. No sign. Took a picture and nothing there. Blank, cor blank corridor. Oh, I got fed up. Got gone midnight, one o'clock in the morning. Fed up with this. I'm going home to go to bed. No ghost. Sorry about that, mate. It, sorry, but it did come. Well, it didn't come this time. It was a scam. That all they wanted was publicity for their printing works. Poor old Peter Elgar, they're going to lose half a night's sleep. All for nothing. That would be, that'd be photography of a ghost. <laughs> mm -hmm.